good afternoon, everybody. And uh, we are very pleased to have the Yves Trignac in the second talk of the week. So, so Yves, he has, he's, he, he has an engineering degree in like electronic system theory and computer science from the Ecole Supérieure de, de l'Electricité. Then he has he made a doctorate in human biology and modeling in Paris 5, in the University of Paris, and then a second doctorate in neuroscience in the University of Paris. And as Elon said on Tuesday, today he's the research director in the CNRS in France, and he's part of a unique group. <laughs> and, uh, and this group is a research unit based on interdisciplinary approach, and it's located at Gips uh, sur that's how it's pronounced, Gips sur and it's this uh, beautiful place that uh, Daniel Schultz showed us on uh, Angeli, if you remember. So today, Eve is going to, to talk about the hidden complexity of the wonder of the field. Thank you very much. Thank you again for this introduction. Uh, yeah, first uh, I apologize to the people who have been to the first talk because you will hear things which are in overlap with what I showed before. But I, I decided to go along the themes that I presented and of course explore them more in depth. Uh, I will not be able to go very far beyond the classical recipe field, but uh, you will have enough with uh, uh, the, the classical recipe field and the natural vision. Uh, so I'm not going to represent again the uh, uh, unique and uh, I just wanted to make a correction. When you say research director at the CNRS, that doesn't mean research director of the CNRS, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which was very nice of you, but uh, <laughs> it's not the case. Uh, and I'm also a professor in oh, you, you, you refuse to get the upgrade or what? <laughs> 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 I, I could actually yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, here is the plan for, for today. Uh, we'll focus the talk on uh, the early visual system. So I, I will start by making a kind of review about what do we know about the early visual system and uh, how much do you think that we can explain about it. Then we'll go again on the hidden complexity in simpleness. So I'll present uh, the type of uh, homeostasis rule that I described before but more, more in depth. Show the, uh, the consequences of the decomposition of the one receptive field into a collection of uh, nonlinear subunits. And we'll uh, use this type of methods to show how, in fact, the receptive field can be up and down regulated with input statistics. And uh, I will present a pioneer, uh, let's say pilot experiments to study spike timing dependent plasticity, where you try to manipulate one subunit independently of the, of the others. Uh, the second part is on this presentation slide that will not be addressed. And I will, uh, in fact, uh, talk about towards a better modeling of the early visual system with natural vision. And uh, I will finish by introducing uh, contextual uh, generalized linear model approaches, which seems to me a, a way of uh, improving uh, our knowledge of the mechanism which are underlying the V1 recipe field. <laughs> So what do we know about the early visual system? So uh, we know from the, the work of uh, Descartes, uh, the representation of Descartes, that if uh, you're analyzing one orientation, one contrast edge in uh, the visual field, it projects through the two eyes to the, uh, on the retina. And these uh, uh, <coughs> homologous uh, projections then travel in the brain along different retinofugal pathway, including one which goes through uh, not the uh, lateral wall of the ventricles as suggested by the cap, but the monocular uh, layer of the thalamus. And these two monocular representations then converge onto a cortical occipital areas. And here uh, in Descartes terms, this is the epiphysis, which is where he's feeding the homunculus, which is analyzing uh, these, uh, these images. And the interesting aspect of the car presentation here is that uh, the visual cortical cell can be seen as our homunculus in a kind of a sensory motor type of loop. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that uh, you're addressing with the end uh, the object that you're looking at. And of course, that's the way natural vision operates, and we're, of course, very far 
to integrate all this confidence in uh, our current description. Now we will talk, of course, about recipe fields, so I will comment again this. And we will talk also briefly about networks, since uh, the, according to the species, uh, this functional selectivity may be organized into uh, uh, columns uh, or bands or not organized in a kind of uh, easy uh, topology uh, uh, description. So uh, the way Yubel and Wiesel analyzed the, the visual system was to uh, explore with handheld stimuli the visual field <coughs> in front of a cat which is anesthetized and paralyzed. The fact that the animal is paralyzed makes things easy because we can back project the fundus of the eye on the screen and uh, then uh, have the uh, uh, corresponding projection of, of uh, the retina and very precisely because of the absence of eye movements plot the recipe field. So if you were doing in addition intracellular recording, it is of course an ideal uh, preparation to study parts of, of the, the processing done during uh, natural vision. So the, the way Jubel and Wiesel worked was to insert an electrode in the cortex, make long tracks which were either orthogonal or in the laminar plane of the cortex, and then at each <coughs> point uh, of recording where they could meet one unit, they would characterize the receptive field and in particular its uh, orientation preference. So the important thing here is that they <coughs> had only a 1D exploration of the visual cortex of this small structure, and they were able to propose a 3D representation of an architecture, which was, uh, with an intuition, which was proven later to be uh, largely correct. So the, the important aspect in uh, the model of Hubel and Wiesel <coughs> is that they thought that uh, receptive fields in uh, the first uh, target cells uh, of uh, area 17 in the cat, or V1 in, uh, in monkey, were formed by the topological union of receptive fields of thalamic cells. And, well, they added one criterion, which was that these uh, uh, thalamic afferents should be of the same size, so on center, and for, the, for instance, and uh, of uh, antagonist surround. And these receptive fields, which were connected to the cell that you were recording from, seem to be aligned. Okay? So there's a wiring specificity, a very high wiring specificity. But the model of genesis of orientation selectivity here is very simple. Because it's the sum of the uh, afferent receptive fields, which is describing the properties of the simple receptive field. So you would predict from that that you would have for this cell, for instance, off region, on region, off <coughs> region, and the orientation preference would be this way. Now they did the same with complex cells, which were insensitive to the contrast of the stimulus, so response could be observed either for an increase, local increase of luminance, or decrease of luminance. And they thought that <coughs> it was a mixture of uh, orientation simple cells, sharing the same orientation preference, but analyzing slightly different regions of the, the receptive field, which were, in fact, leading to a cell which was capable of analyzing orientation selectivity independently of the spatial phase within the receptive field. So it can be seen as a kind of generalization operation where you get rid of position and you represent orientation. And of course, this was based on a structural uh, uh, correspondence of a hierarchical scheme of uh, visual cortical areas where simple cells were found in uh, uh, V1, uh, complex cells in V2, and so on. What story uh, retains from that, what history retains from that, is that basically everybody has confirmed the, these types of receptive field, the fact that you have isotropic and concentric antagonist receptive field in retina and thalamus, that the symmetry breaking occurs uh, at the uh, cortical level, so the the receptive fields of the spiking receptive fields become oriented, and the spatial segregation is seen in simple cell, and the overlap of an off region is seen in another type of cell, complex cell. Okay. Then the intuition of the uh, functional hypertalon of Jubel and Wiesel, where he plotted on the surface of the cortex orientation on one axis and ocular dominance on the other axis, was largely confirmed by. Uh, voltage sensitive dioptical imaging techniques or by two-photon and calcium imaging techniques. Right? 
So it's remarkable uh, that somebody doing 1D exploration of a structure is capable of thinking of uh, 3D architecture. And if you look now in the literature, you see that the dominant view of uh, the visual brain solving, for instance, object recognition is uh, a mixture of feed forward, mostly dominantly feed forward pathways, uh, where columnar uh, entities seem to be uh, working uh, together at a more mesoscopic scale. So the, the type of description that we have, uh, even in recent papers, is largely dominated by the hierarchical view uh, shown by Yubel and Rizzo. Now, if we look at the beautiful data in the rat and the cat using two-photon imaging, you find some kind of strong differences between species. <coughs> and uh, you see that in the rat, shells seem to be orientation selective. So here, a color means that from the uh, optical imaging recording, you, you'll find that this cell is responding to a given orientation, right? So the cell of the same colors are sharing the same orientation preference. And you see the corresponding data in the cat. So if I summarize, if I represent uh, the way Heim would do perhaps uh, uh, the cortex as a kind of uh, spin, and I give to each spin a given color uh, according to its orientation, I seem to have independent uh, orientation tune cells determine, uh, determined mostly by their feed forward connectivity, whereas now in, in the cat, it seems that I have a kind of field uh, as if uh, we have some kind of uh, uh, easing model uh, of the cortex. Now, the interesting aspect is that it may be a difference in feedforward connectivity on the, the strength of the uh, and organization of the, the input, but I think more likely it reflects the fact that it could be poorer in this system in terms of short-range interaction, whereas the fact that you see orientation preference co line as you moved along the, the cortical distance within the, the laminar plane of the cortex suggests long-range interactions, right? So the, the, the weights of the different types of connectivity may be different functionally and may explain why in one case you get one column in the other case you don't get one column. So now if I'm, if I'm taking spice-based receptive field models, here is the dominant microcircuits that have been reported. For simple cell, you have a kind of push-pull organization, which is uh, responsible for uh, this uh, spatial segregation of uh, on and off responses and antagonists within the receptive field, going through a rectified, uh, almost linearity. Okay? And for the uh, complex cells, you have the energy model, where you have two branch composing your receptive field, where the first stage looks like a simple input, simple filter going through a positive quadratic nonlinearity, and the other input is uh, 90 degree out of phase and goes through uh, the same type of nonlinearity. These are historically the dominant simple and complex receptive field models. And then a lot of people like Carandini, Kriber, Ringer, Chaplet, Eager have added to this story a certain number of patchwork of mechanism which would complexify slightly the model. So what you will see here is that, for instance, the input of the thalamus is not uh, a linear input. It's an half-wave rectified input, so you have to take that into account. You need to have, at the thalamocortical level, synaptic depression. Uh, you will describe that push-pull inhibition uh, exists and is uh, poorly uh, balanced. And you will find uh, effects from the, the far periphery, which is influencing your cell and some divisive non-specific non non suppression that you have to, to have in order to get, let's say, uh, uh, a receptive field which has some added non-linearity, right? But basically, it's still the idea that you will have linear operators followed by some kind of static non-linearities. And of course, for engineers, it's a good, good approach because you can do a lot of things with that. Now, as soon as you complexify the dynamics of the stimulus, you forget about Fourier inputs or Dirac functions, and you use natural light contrast dynamics. So you can do uh, showing a natural scenes that you explore with eye movements, or you can do something a bit uh, more tricky, 
which will be to have the best grating optimizing the recipe field, the responses for the recipe field, right? And vary the contrast in a very uh, uh, transient fashion. And so with that type of, uh, of protocol, uh, you can show that the uh, classical LN model in trans modeling is not working at all. It works at the spiking level, which means that you find very often the spike where you should have them for this type of uh, simplified uh, natural, natural light contrast dynamics. But you see that the membrane potential, uh, in fact, is very transiently activated. And the linear, the, the, this type of model, or the, this type of models, are just having a very poor temporal responses and are a kind of uh, uh, smoothing uh, uh, of the responses, which doesn't predict so the, 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 the interplay of conductances to explain the behavior of the cell. And and so the two traces here, the, the traces are 10 trials, which are overlaid. And the, and the yeah, yeah. Here, this is the average in black. And the red is the prediction by the LN model. So basically, the LN model misses its target at the sub threshold level. And you but see... The average is much more than two, right? Sorry? It's more than two trials, the average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At 10, 10 trials. It's these 10 trials. 10 trials, yeah. And you're seeing that the, uh, the model is predicting the rate fluctuation but is not predicting, in fact, the precision uh, of the reliability of the uh, uh, firing of the cell across fires. So you're very far already to, uh, to answer to this type of, of dynamics. It's just to show you the, the first limitation. Now, if you uh, use the kind of equivalent feed-forward circuit, which will be <coughs> monosynaptic, well, feed-forward excitation, and a feed forward inhibition, so which goes to an inhibitor internal, which targets your nerve. And then you uh, put a delay between the feed forward inhibition and the feed forward excitation of about 5 to 8 milliseconds. Then you will fit the sub threshold membrane potential dynamics rather nicely. So be very careful, it's a, an apparent feed forward circuit. It just gives you a phenomenological view of the behavior of the cell. And of course, uh, five to eight milliseconds disynaptic delay is, uh, is not a delay of one synapse, it's the delay of a circuit. So the recurrent circuit has been simplified into a equivalent circuit. So you have to uh, realize uh, the difference between a phenomenological model and uh, a causal model. So here, if I summarize what I just said, well, I can quote Matteo Carandini and many others in uh, a beautiful uh, uh, review paper which was published in 2005 in the Journal of Neuroscience. Now, these are their answers, okay? And then you will see within my talk how, how far we are from it or is it confirmed. Do we know what the other visual system does? We can claim, says Matteo, that we know what the visual system does once we can predict neural responses to arbitrary stimuli, including those seen in nature. Then spike-based LN, LNP models account for 40 to 60 percent of spike rate variance. So for them, these models are good to predict spikes. So if they are good to predict spikes, that means that they have a mechanism. And my view will be that you need a multi-scale description, and then you will realize that these models fail to predict correctly the memory potential dynamics. So now there is usually in these models a nonlinearity, which is an expensive power uh, function, uh, which is a static nonlinearity, which is usually non-adaptive, which is thought to be postsynaptic, but uh, you may wonder is it stimulus or network driven? Because this coefficient, the, the, if you want the power function that you put after the linear filter, reflects maybe uh, the stimulus statistics or reflects some type of network influence and will vary from one stimulus condition to the other, okay? So here there's a big, big problem here. And issues are operational LNP models, reducible to structural functional correlates. Are they purely phenomenological or what do they reveal on intracortical computation, right? So for this, we'll do a multi-scale description 
of this receptive field, just see what are the basic mechanisms which are revealed by the intracellular analysis. So the argument I'm making here is that when you're listening to the synaptic echoes, you are in fact recording the influence of the functional network of effective connectivity in which the cell is embedded at each point in time. Right? So the cell, by its subthreshold activity, tells you who is talking to, to it, to itself, during the time of recording, and then you have a lot of uh, processing to demultiplex these input lines and make a sense of what you're seeing. Right. So now the hidden complexity in synchronous, so the actors, the main actors are Julien Fournier, uh, who is now working uh, at the Max Planck with uh, Gilles Laurent, and as I told you, Cyril Monnier, who has been really impressed by the <coughs> complexity found in our experiments. Okay, and then we are going through these uh, different parts, and I start by the literature by saying, okay, a lot of people have been working on the uh, <coughs> primary visual cell, so in terms of spatial segregation of on and off subfields, some people have recorded them both at the spike level and at the sub level, right? So if you compare the two maps, so for one cell, this is this box with this one, for another cell, this is this box and this one, you're seeing that according to a uh, Martinez ESCL, there is a very good correspondence between the sub receptive field and the spiking receptive field. So according to them, you don't learn much by going in cross -over. Same for complex cell, and if now you plot the uh, segregation or correlation, spatial correlation coefficient, saying whether the cell is simple, so spatially segregated on a north region, or complex overlapping regions, they found of a large number of cells the tendency to have two populations, so which means that there is a dichotomy. Some cells are simple, other cells are complex. Now, another way of characterizing the uh, uh, simplicity or the complexity of the cell is to use a drifting grating, and in a simple cell, it's a linear cell, which will follow with the membrane potential the temporal frequency uh, of the stimulus, of the grating, and which will emit uh, at the top of the depolarization a spike which is in phase during the, the whole process. So you can use, uh, you can measure the uh, principal harmonic uh, predominance, and you will add here the definition of a simple linear cell in opposition to a complex nonlinear cell which raises its activity while you're drifting the stimulus of right? So this is a second type of criterion that you can use. And if you use this type of criterion, the story is slightly uh, different depending which author you're looking at, but you're, you're seeing that you find again two distributions of, of uh, cells, some which are simple, some which are complex, some which are modulating, some which are not modulating. But you see that at the sub level, the story is much less decisive, okay? Uh, you, you have an overlap of the distribution of simple and complex cells. Okay, so the, the, the approach that we use was to say, okay, if in order to characterize a simple cell, you use uh, LNP uh, approaches, we are predicting that if we use different types of white noise, done with sparse noise, done with ternary dense noise, done with gabber noise, the linear kernel identification should be the same. That's the, the Bousgain theorem. And so you, you can start doing that for the same cells and present this different type of stimuli. So this is the sparse stimuli, one square light or dark at different uh, position in the field. This is the ternary dense noise, so remember, there's mean luminance light or dark, that will allow you to compute on and off kernels, even in complex cells. Right? And on the right, you get uh, the gamma okay. So uh, then you proceed to a Volterra decomposition of the subthreshold residual dynamics in response to, uh, let's say, the ternary dense noise in the example here. And uh, you will, of course, extract the linear kernel and you will compute the second order kernel, and in order to make a fair comparison with the sparse noise, you will truncate your expansion and consider only the diagonal term of the uh, second order kernel, because you're not exploring this with the sparse noise. 
So, as an electrophysiologist, a visual electrophysiologist, I'm able to compute the uh, on kernel and the off kernel. So here you've got the on map and the off map of the same same cell for sparse noise, these boxes, and for ternary dense noise, these boxes. And you see here the, the difference in terms of amplitude of the, and the shape of the linear kernel to a uh, different location in the receptive field when I'm stimulating with sparse noise and when I'm stimulating with dense noise. What are you seeing here, for instance, if I take the uncharacteristic, you see that it looks much more simple for dense noise than for sparse noise. And if you look, the comparison between the amplitude of the black and red uh, kernels here you find a factor of 10, of 10. So there's a divisive effect due to the ternary full field dense noise that you're using compared to sparse noise. The responses are much smoother, but they, they, they are of very small amplitude, right? And you can see that the shape and the latency are not the same depending where you are looking in the field. So now, if I'm using the diagonal term of the second order kernel only, I can switch from the on-off uh, kernels to the linear nonlinear kernel in a very simple fashion. I take as the linear kernel, the simple light receptive field component, the difference for the same pixel of the on response and the off response divided by two. That's the way most people in the old days were doing simple receptive fields. And for the diagonal term, I'm making the sum of the on and the off responses in the same pixel divided by two, and I get the complex light receptive field component. So now when you do the same analysis as before to so the same cell, you're seeing it here the linear kernel, which has a small, simple receptive field with on and off responses uh, segregated for sparse noise, and a huge complex response for sparse noise. Whereas for ternary dense noise, I have a huge simple linear component and a small complex component for ternary dense noise, which means that when I'm using a simple stimulus, the cell tends to be complex, and when I'm using the complex stimuli, the cell tends to be simple. It is the same cell. So already this prediction is, well, this result is very far from the classical description <coughs> of simple and complex So. As I told you uh, the, the other time, I can plot the simpleness index, which will be the ratio of the energy of the linear kernel divided by the energy of the linear kernel plus the diagonal term of the second order kernel. For the two contexts, sparse noise versus dense noise. So if my cell is more simple, it means that the points go towards zero, uh, towards one, sorry. And uh, so if it's, more, if it's more simple for dense noise, than for sparse noise, I should be in this corner. If the cell was insensitive to uh, stimulus statistic, I should be along the diagonal. So if you record different cells in different caps, so this is what is most remarkable here, what you find is that these results are grouped along the hyperbolic function and this hyperbolic function can be explained by two parameters, alpha and beta. Alpha and beta being the uh, stimulus dependency of the linear kernel and the second order kernel. So it's the ratio of the linear kernel for sparse noise divi divided by dense noise, which is your alpha, and uh, the, the same calculation for the, the uh, diagonal term. So just remember that if you were using a classical LN model, you would not have uh, a linear relationship between these, uh, these two uh, adaptation of linear and second order kernel. You would have a parabolic function between the two. Okay, so now the, the continued experiment. You fill the cell with biocytin. You reconstruct the cell, so we did that with the Zoltan and uh, it's remarkable to see that the cells which are the less sensitive to input statistics are in fact the target cells in layer 4 and the border of layer 5 and 6 and the cells which are the most sensitive so the furthest away to the diagonal are in fact cells of layer 2, 3 and here are examples of different cells which have been reported in these experiments which shows you that uh, of course 
it could be that in uh, uh, the, the lamina which receive the direct input, the, the dependency on the feed forward afferents are stronger, but this is not the case uh, for outside these uh, recipient layers. Now what I showed you here can be seen not only of course for VM, but also for the spike activity. So in general the spike activity is not so easy, I mean you need to have enough spikes in order to get a good computation of these indexes. So that's why you don't have as many points here that you have here, but you find the same type of uh, hyperbolic function. And here you see the, the relation between the second diagonal uh, term of the, uh, uh, of the second order kernel and the uh, linear kernel, which is a straight line, both for the spike and for the n. Whereas normally you should have a quadratic relationship in a classical model. Okay. So uh, we we try different types of models. So we try to simulate with uh, uh, this type of uh, perceptive field uh, with uh, let's say uh, ad hoc uh, excitatory input and uh, inhibitory input and nonlinearities. We try to simulate. Uh, different types of cells with different simpleness index. <coughs> and then we compare, we compare models which are supposing that you get adaptation mechanisms with the input statistics which are on the linear branch and the nonlinear branch separately as we show here in our data. Okay? And you can do uh, uh, other types of model, more classical model, where you put the adaptation common to the postsynaptic integration, or you put the divisive effect on the presynaptic uh, input, or to both of them. And in fact, you can show that these two models are not predicting at all what you're observing, and it's only this model, <coughs> or this one with a very uh, precise titration of the two, uh, the, the, the two adaptive mechanisms, which accounts for, uh, for our data. You can even show mathematically that this model can be shown uh, equivalent to this one. Yes. What are the inputs? Yeah. The inputs will be uh, here uh, submitting these recipes here what are the stimuli? to the same stimulus, uh, sparse noise and tenor dance. Uh -huh. Okay. This is a simulation of the experiment just to see how, how can you account with classical models of what we are observing. And the result is that, in fact, uh, you have to touch both at the presynaptic and, and uh, uh, postsynaptic nonlinearity in order to uh, uh, account for our experiments. So a classical LN with a static nonlinearity will not work. So that now the, the interesting aspect, which makes in fact uh, things more more exciting, is uh, the fact that we find the same type of uh, function for sparse noise uh, for for cells which are recorded in different animals, right? So what we decided to do was to see whether there was a general rule that could be extracted from that. And the way we did it was by uh, looking at the current corresponding to the linear processing versus the current corresponding to the nonlinear processing. And for that, we looked at the convolution between the, uh, uh, the, the input, the visual input, and the receptive field itself, right? In sparse noise condition and in dense noise condition. And what you see now is that the simpleness index, which here is computed as the uh, linear kernel convoluted with the input energy divided by the sum of the linear input and the uh, nonlinear input going through that uh, stimulus or having this stimulus going through uh, these nonlinear kernels will reach in fact uh, the identity line which means that it seems that there is a kind of uh, homeostasis rule which works for sparse noise versus dense noise which works for Gabor noise versus dense noise so you see that in fact it's totally independent of the pair of stimuli that we're using and which tells you that uh, I have this adaptation rule where I maintain constant the ratio between the two and then I get this regulation of the receptive field. So the, 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 this result is this result surprising. The fact that cell can be a simple or complex depending on the type of input statistics and compensate in a certain way the complexity of the input. So here, this is an old work. This was the cover of uh, uh, the Journal of Physiology in 1998, where we showed that you could up and down regulate it through a correlation supervised plasticity, through ATM 
plasticity, where the experimenter is the teacher and reinforces the response of the cell or blocks the response of the cell depending whether I'm presenting a stimulus on or off, we showed that we could turn complex cells into simple cells. Now, uh, here you see uh, the model of chan where complex cells were seen as cortically amplified simple cells. And so there were already in the literature a certain number of uh, experimental and theoretical evidence saying that the simpleness can be regulated. So here, this is an example, I cannot resist showing my old work, where we, we, we are presenting a stimulus associated with a, a blockade of activity, and then use the other uh, characteristics of the stimulation paired with uh, a positive current, or so an increase of discharge. So here you see that this profile, which is dominant on with a small uh, off ribbon here, is regulated by the uh, correlation-based uh, pairing, such as now the cell becomes dominant off in the paired region, and you see that the other part of the residue field is not affected. So we have data which were showing that, contrast to what Tubal and Wiesel would be saying, you could up and down regulate small portion of the residue fields based on covariance if you look in the literature of uh, other people, uh, for instance, uh, Bardi et al. in 2006, they showed that there was a contextual dependency in the expression of simpleness. And they looked at a complex cell where uh, they stimulated the cell with a small uh, patch grating. And then they surrounded the patch grating by uh, surround with a different orientation. Or they made the uh, center and the surround with the same orientation. And you see that depending on the context of the center and the serum, you seem to make the linear behavior more apparent. Okay? I change the context, and the cell which was complex becomes simple. Now, uh, here, uh, this is another type of experiments where they inactivated area 20, so higher cortical areas. And when they were inactivating area 20, the cell which would be, let's say, uh, more like complex cells becomes suddenly simple. So different type of uh, uh, connectivity, lateral connectivity, or feedback connectivity may be involved in, in these effects. So basically what we're saying is that the receptive field need to uh, take into account the context. And the context can be either the full field of stimulus statistics, this is what we played with, or it can be the neighboring influence within the laminar to which they belong. So for instance, cell A here is in iso-preference domain, so all the neighbors are sharing the same orientation, whereas cell B is in a pinwheel, and it has neighbors which are talking differently. So the, 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 the influence of the network will be different in that case and in that case. Or you're looking at cells which are in different layers of the cortex, and there again, the, the context is different. So uh, our results also remind uh, the finding of now host Giuseppe Carandini and Ringar in 2008, where they show the same type of regulation of the receptive field for low or high contrast. Okay? So the way you are going to drive your entire cortex will affect the functional expression of the receptive field. So uh, we decided to go uh, one step further. And we decided to uh, use a method, well, a method close to the one used by Rust, uh, Schwartz, Motion, Simoncelli in Neuron, which made the cover of their uh, journal, trying to unravel spatial temporal elements of V1 receptive fields. So they could show that their method worked in V1 and in NT, and using spike triggered covariance analysis and using 1D uh, dense noise they were able to uh, propose a much richer receptive field structure. So the topology of the receptive field is no longer the one that you have in A and B, the classical ones, but is a kind of generalized LNP receptive field where you have here the linear branch, here the excitatory nonlinearities, and here the suppressive nonlinearities, which are then pulled together and uh, made the prediction of the receptive field. Okay? So when you do that, so you find. So 
multiple complex shells. Yes, exactly. So you have, you have each recipe field is composed of a parallel bank of filters, some being linear, one being linear, the others being nonlinear, and the nonlinear filters are going through a positive or negative polarity linearities. Right? So, I mean, if, if it's not working, if a simple cell is simple, well, these coefficients are going to be zero. You're not going to find the subunits. But when they applied this type of stimulation, spike triggered covariance, they were able to find subunits. So the same experiment was done in CAP by the group of Young and uh, Young Dam and others, and the result was very deceiving. They didn't find subunits in simple cells. Okay, so we decided to go for intracellular and repeat this type of experiments using our ternary dense noise and using a similar structure, so a spike figure average going through a linear uh, linearity with contrast, then having the ex excitatory subunit going through a quadratic nonlinearity and having the inhibitory subunits going through a, a negative uh, nonlinearity. So note that if I'm using spike, these uh, suppressive uh, subunits cannot be said as being inhibitory. We need to go to the current level or to the uh, conductance level in order to do it. So we did it at the voltage level, at the uh, current level, at the uh, conductance level, and the best results we got, for technical reasons, were the current level. Okay, so when you do that, same story as before, and you will decompose the second order kernel, the full second order kernel, by PCA. And when you do the, the PCA analysis, you will find a certain number of subunits where you add one condition. It has to be a, a kind of simple like filter followed by the quadratic nonlinearity. Okay, that's the way we choose the, the function to explain what it is. So, uh, the PCA the whole population of, of filters? Sorry? I don't understand the PCA on the whole population? No, on it's, on it's, done, it's done on one cell. On for one each cell. On for each cell. cell. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, if you go into the detail of it, you use then the current base equation in order to uh, retrieve the, the memory potential. And so you have, in addition to what I'm showing, you have also to optimize the time <laughs> constant of, of the, of, of the uh, current equation. Okay. So when you do that, it's a parallel cascade model. You find, even for target cell in layer 4 and uh, layer 6, you find the beautiful linear component of a classical horizontal Eubel and Diesel cell. But in addition to that, you'll see now the subunits. And look at the excitatory subunits here. They have a filter which is orthogonal in orientation preference to the uh, spike based preference. They have uh, also here a nonlinear suppressive unit. And uh, so you have a diversity of subunits that you can look at now at the population level. So uh, once you do that, you can make measures. So I'm just skipping that, but just to tell you that we measure how much the linear kernel, for instance, is up and down regulated and changes in latency according to the type of stimulus that we are showing. So this is taken into account in the description. And here, this is the summary uh, when you pull all the subunits together. So what you're seeing here is that for each cell, you can show that the subunits, for instance, the six excitatory subunits and these two inhibitory subunits contribute to the spike activity. Okay, so that means that these nonlinear components are real. They are real in the sense that they are operational in terms of regulating the activity of the cell. If I'm making now on all the cells, if I'm making the, uh, if I'm looking at the excitatory subunits, okay, so I put all the excitatory subunits together, and I look at the orientation distribution preference. Your intuition looking at Preber and Fessler would be to say that all the excitatory subunits should be iso-oriented. What do you find? They are not iso-oriented. There is a dominance of iso-orientation but there are a large number of cases where it may even be orthogonal. And for the inhibition, you have a strong dominance of inhibitory subunits, orthogonal to the spike-based preference. Now, if I look at the difference between simple and complex cell, it's not the number of subunits, so it's what you could have guessed. You could have said, well, uh, I have more subunits with, uh, with complex cells than with simple cells, but this is not the case. 
The main difference is in fact the weight, the weight of the excitatory subunit and inhibitory subunits, which is m stronger for complex cell than for simple cells. Right. So now if I look in the literature, I look at my own work with my colleagues, Monier Chavan and Raman in 2003, where we measured directly the input conductance to the cells. So we have a uh, recorded a cell, we went into voltage scan, and we made measures of the excitatory and inhibitory conductance going to the cell. And our findings were the following. We found here you have a beast program which put the preferred orientation of the input to the cell, where zero degree here is the spike based preference. Okay? So if the model was ISO ISO, ISO excitation, ISO inhibition, all the points should be there. So what are you finding? You're finding that there are a lot of points here which tells you that there is a dominance of ISO orientation preference, but note that there are points here which are far away from the preferred orientation. And then if you look at inhibition, inhibition is everywhere uh, in relation to the uh, orientation preference based on spikes. And you see here you have a, a very nice relationship where in fact you have excitation and inhibition which share the same orientation preference, but because of the interplay, they create spiking selectivity elsewhere. Right, so you, you get exactly the same type of result. And so now you can say, okay, well, I, I want to make a functional interpretation. Of course, I know this is PCA uh, methods, so I tend to make orthogonal excitation inhibition in a certain way. So you have to be uh, careful about that. But what you could say is that the subunits may tell you within the network which columns are in fact feeding and competing on yourself. So you're seeing the richness of the repertoire. So basically it would be very interesting to use a stimulus which reveal the most spectrum of input and then use that, use these uh, subunits as a kind of eigenvector basis on which you will decompose the responses of the cell for whatever input subunits. Right? So if you uh, do that, uh, if you do that, well, you have a kind of working hypothesis where you will have, in a way, uh, the linear kernel which is representing the feed forward drive, and uh, these subunits will represent the, the, the competing sources. Right, so uh, now if I do what I expected to do, same cell, and I start first by the ternary dance noise. So ternary dance noise gives, gives me in that cell six subunits, you have the weights which are here, and two inhibitory subunits. Right. So now I'm going to see what happens to this decomposition when I go to sparse noise and gabor noise. But you're seeing in fact that a certain number of, uh, uh, of uh, weights are dramatically changed, so for instance the uh, linear kernel here, but look here, the first subunit here becomes much more dominant for the sparse noise, the fourth one becomes much more dominant for, uh, for uh, dense noise than for sparse noise, and so on. So you see this up and down regulation of the subunits explaining the same receptive field and its functional adaptation. So what do you know? You're refitting the nonlinearity? Yeah. yeah. But keeping the fit. Exactly. So we're making a strong assumption. I agree with you. You could, you could refit yeah. the. Yeah, yeah. But here we, we are trying just to say is it feasible to think that way? Okay. So uh, now I show you uh, that we can do it within the time of recording of the cell. So you're going to present during 10 minutes, 10 minutes, the ternary dance noise. <coughs> and then you will see online, so the activity of the cell. So you see uh, during ternary dance noise, it's not a, you don't like it. And here you have the linear kernel, which is going to be constructed. Here you get the PC analysis online. And here you have the subunits, which are building up progressively. And after 10 minutes, you will reach uh, a level uh, where the, the shape of certain number of subunits is not modified. And this will lead you to uh, the identification of the significant eigenvectors here and one significant inhibitory light vector. So you can go one step further and say, okay, I have some ID. 
during the time of recording of the decomposition into sodiness. So what I would like to do now is prove that this is not only an operational decomposition. I want to think that there is some function in this subunit. So what can I do? Well, perhaps I can use spike timing dependent plasticity protocol or correlation based protocol to uh, associate one of these subunits with the modulation of the time of arrival of, of the postsynaptic spark and up and down regulate the weight of this subunit without touching the others. That would be cool. I mean, if you were able to do that, that would be cool. So we started this experiment, so I'm presenting just uh, uh, not the final result because I don't have it. And these are very difficult experiments, so we are the limit of what we can do. So I have a, a cell, and I've, I've seen very uh, clearly, uh, let's say, two subunits. So here we have the linear kernel, a linear subunit, and here the second order kernel. So what we're going to do is to play during the, the pairing, we are going to play the uh, optimal stimulus for the, for the kernel. So we are going to play the filter in reverse time. So you play the kernel in reverse time with a filter, it gives you the maximum response, and from that you have an estimate of the response of the cell. So here you're seeing the, the response uh, of the cell to the, uh, when using the, uh, of the subunit, if you want, of the subunit, which is the, the nonlinear one, and this is the linear one. So you will do a, a, a decomposition, then you record across time uh, the relative weight or, or, or responses of your uh, different subunits, and then you make a pairing. And the pairing will be, when I'm presenting the movie for the second order kernel, I will apply a positive pulse. Okay, I will increase the correlation. I will do that for the first pairing with the second order kernel. I will do that for the second pairing with the linear kernel, and I will redo that for the second order kernel, uh, a new kernel. So what you're seeing here is that <coughs> in shaded uh, profile here, you're seeing what happens to uh, the response to the film corresponding to the linear kernel. And you see that basically the response doesn't depress at the first pairing, except uh, significantly at the second pairing. And you see here that the nonlinear subunit here sees its weight depress for each pairing corresponding to uh, its stimulation. So you see uh, the, the, the responses in terms of uh, voltage and time. So the, the red curve is after pairing, the, the gray curve is before pairing. So you see a clear potentiation of the pair uh, subunit, not, not significant changes of the unpaired subunit. Here you see that the two subunits are unchanged when I'm pairing the linear kernel subunit. And here you see that again we have a strong effect, similar to the first one, when we do uh, the pairing on uh, the second subunit. Right? So you see that to a certain degree here we're getting a negative, negative, depressive effect of uh, the second order kernel which has been paired uh, with spiking activity. Okay? So it's like, uh, as if we have one point in a curve of SCDP, which will be in fact negative SCDP and not the speed of CDP. I recall you that here this is done in the adult cortex, so it may be true that uh, uh, this is the case. Okay. So, uh, that is the, the, the conclusion of, of this talk, and I don't think that I go very far after that. I just try to convince you of the uh, strength with which we demonstrate a kind of almost basis in the functional expression of receptive field uh, by maintaining constant the balance between linear and nonlinear input. We interpret these uh, changes as a network, mesoscopic network regularization. So the, the idea is that for complex like uh, receptive field, the use of sparse input is due to a kind of upregulation of the receptive field size, which may do to a much more efficient lateral propagation. We observe longer latency and less inhibition. Now when the cell becomes simple like because I'm using the ternary dense input, the receptive field shrinks 
the latencies are shorter, and uh, the conductor state is dominated by inhibition and is high conductor state. Okay, so I mean, so you can say that the regularization that you're observing, the fact that the cell looks more simple, doesn't mean that the mechanisms are simpler. It's just because you have a lot of recruitment, simultaneous recruitment of nonlinear local processes that the cell looks, the receptive field looks more simple. Okay? This is perhaps difficult to grasp, but uh, that's the right. So, uh, yeah. For those who have seen the, the first talk, I'm showing you here two, two or three slides just to show you uh, how classical models fail to uh, account for responses to uh, natural scenes. So uh, the type of scenes that we're presenting are just drifting grating, which is called DG here, or natural scenes animated with virtual eye movement. So we made the recordings of the eye movements in the uh, uh, intact cat, or we took the data uh, in the literature for color vision, for instance, in the intact cat, we make a realistic model of animation of eye movements, and we apply it in the anesthetized paralyzed preparation. So we don't have, of course, proprioception, we don't have a current copy, we just have the retinal or realistic retinal flow produced by eye movements. Right? And we use frozen eye movements, which means that we play a movie where the cat is looking at a cat with a field flower, and this is repeated 10 times, and the visual seeds are exactly the same. So we, we are taking advantage of uh, the, perf the perfect fixation in the uh, paralyzed cap to uh, uh, make better, better measurements. So uh, you start by doing the recipe field with, with dense noise, and then you look from your classical LN model of the recipe field how much it predicts the behavior of the cell with another seed of ternary densities. And if you look at the correlation, in fact, the correlation is good. It's around 0.8. Now, this recipe field, explained with ternary dense noise, will account for the responses to grading. But you will observe that, in fact, you need to have a kind of divisive, divisive term. So you need a kind of eager term in order, in order to account for the, the response to grading. And they say that the uh, correlation coefficient is the order of zero, 0 0.6. And now if I'm taking this grating and animate the gratings with the virtual eye movements, you see that you get already a lot of problems. You're not correctly uh, simulating what's happening in the recipe field. And for natural scenes, you go below 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Not, uh, so which means that you go uh, to values which will be... Uh, 10% uh, at most of explained variance by this type of model. So remember the 40 to 60% of explained variance by Count EAL. If you go to the self threshold of the field, you're failing completely. And so if you make coherence measures as a function of frequency, uh, you can uh, compute what is expected in black, what is predicted, and what would give uh, some. Uh, shuffled input. So basically what you're saying is that the two curves, black and red, are in overlap and maintain too low frequencies for the, the drifting rating. But for animated scenes, you see that there are a lot of nonlinearities. So the nonlinearities are where there is a distance between the, the black curve and the red curve, both for rating with eye movements and for natural images. And then you're getting to much higher, to much higher so the nonlinearities are there, you're just missing them massively with the classical models. And uh, now if I'm looking, if I'm looking at the trial to trial reliability and precision, I can use, for instance, cross correlation in the voltage between trials. Right? So the, the peak amplitude of this uh, correlation function will give you, in fact, the reliability. And the width of these functions will tell you the precision of the code. Okay? And so what you're seeing here, basically, is that the, the stimuli, which are the much better, are 
creating an eye movements and natural images. And if I'm looking now at the stimulus plot, at the stimulus plot, variance in the profile of activity of the voltage, I see that uh, drifting grating uh, are in fact creating more noise than uh, natural images in particular. So natural images seems to improve the noise reduction in uh, the membrane potential, meaning that the behavior, the dynamic behavior of your system is more clamped during natural scene animation than with uh, four stimuli like uh, filtering grating. And you can make a signal noise ratio analysis to show exactly the, the same result. Okay. So uh, I finish by saying how can we reconcile what we are seeing with the uh, classical model? So I have two, two minutes. And it's really very fast. If you use a, a, a classical uh, push-pull model, the push-pull model is done to uh, take into account the responses to gratings, and so you can make conductance-based uh, models, which are fitting very nicely the data that we are observing. And you note that these push-pull models are models where you have local recurrency. So it's not it's not a feed-forward model; it's a recurrent model of the receptive field, which is fitted for drifting gratings. So part of the results that I show are surprisingly explained with natural scenes. Why? Because when you're stimulating with natural scenes, you are stimulating non-optimally this receptive field. Okay? And so if you're stimulating non-optimally this receptive field, simulation shows that then, rather than having inhibition period without excitation, excitation without inhibition, you've got combined excitation inhibition and you've got very thin spiking opportunity window, which are built by uh, opposite transition between excitation and inhibition. So if you want, the, the phasic construction of the responses to uh, natural scenes can be explained if you have a push-pull model on one end, and if you have thermoparticle depression. So both of them are needed in order to account for some of the features. But this type of model failed totally <coughs> in explaining the reduction of noise during natural scenes. So what is interesting with uh, the type of approach that we are developing is that we are finding critical tests that you can apply to any model to say, okay, this model is satisfactory at the spiking level, this model is satisfactory at the spiking and voltage level, or we cannot account for one mechanism, and there you have to invent another type of nonlinearity or, or another type of mechanism. Okay, so here, for instance, is the type of simulations that we're getting here is the in vivo data, the model uh, for using grating for natural scene animations. And you see that there is a, a very nice correspondence between what we observe in vivo, what we observe in the model, for both conditions. And here you see the interplay of the conductance between excitation and inhibition. And it is this push pull structure <coughs> plus the thalamocortical depression, which is accounting for. Okay? And now I finish by. Yes. Where do we stand? And uh, I will thank Bruno Olschusen uh, in his beautiful paper in 20 years of learning about vision. At the end of the day, we are faced with this simple truth. No one has yet spelled out a detailed model of V1 that incorporates its true biophysical complexity and exploits this complexity to process visual information in a meaningful or useful way. The problem is not just that we lack the proper data that we don't even have the right conceptual framework for thinking about what is happening. I love this sentence. <laughs> and Matteo Carondini uh, wrote, failure of a linear receptive field model is not a problem for neurophysiologists, but it is for those computational models who would like all neurons in the visual cortex to be described in a few lines of elegant code. So I think it's rather cynical here. That, that is my I think the, the, the problem is that 
it, it's just basically the, the, the equivalent circuit that I was presenting at the beginning. That is that uh, people have a description of, for instance, if I take the push-pull model, which is a recurrent circuit, and I stimulate it with non-optimal stimuli, like natural vision, I can describe it by a feed-forward circuit, which will be feed-forward inhibition. Very simple stuff. But it's the same circuit. It's a push-pull recurrent in both cases. It's just that the behavior will be described by this feed-forward inhibition very nicely. Okay, so uh, that, that, that shows you the, the difficulty of the task, which is that uh, you may have a description which fits the data, but which is purely phenomenological. So you have to find real arguments to say, well, my operational decomposition may have some truth or not. So for instance, the plasticity experiments that I was showing was a way of addressing this question. Although I know that my operational model will always lead me to say that inhibition is later than excitation. Why? Because the part of the excitatory nonlinearity comes from the uh, depolarization uh, of the responses. And the part of the uh, uh, inhibitory nonlinearities comes from the hyperpolarizing uh, phase of the response. So here, I, I will be confident that inhibition is following excitation. That if excitation is with inhibition, I missed it. This is what we showed, uh, I showed that in the first talk, how you miss the role of shunting inhibition. In the circuit. 